process of metal. Cool. <laughs> um, just let me handle it. Or do I have to mess with our microphone? I might have to mess with our microphone. I might have turned it off. No? USB mic? Yes. Should be good. Oh, I can, uh, you're doing that phone so I can listen to it on my yeah. your thingy to see if it's working. Good. Are you guys able to hear us? Is everything coming through okay? Do we need to change anything? Can't. Awesome. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, make sure your um, quality is turned up on YouTube so that you can see the lines really well and you can see all the text on the screen. Yes. If you don't know how to do that, just message me and I will tell you. And just let us know when you guys are ready. studio might join us. Why is my pen not working? Does this pen not work with this thing? It should work. That's not enough. I'm glad you guys can hear us. We're having a little bit of tablet trouble. So we're going to see if we can get that working. What are you looking for now? Oh, I think I got it to work. Yay! Yep. Yay! Okay. Oh my. That humming would be um, oh, we can our, turn off our air purifier. 
uh, yeah, it might be our air purifier. Is the humming gone now? Hi, Trevor. Uh, so Trevor is actually one of the students who works with us in our studio. Um, I am glad that you're you're able to hop on here. Uh, did you press any of his artwork? I haven't yet. Um, so to let you guys know who we are, I'm Amanda, and are we on camera? We are not. Do, do camera. Oh. So they can see what we look like, that we're actual humans. We're going to flip back and forth being on camera uh, while I'm digitally painting, while we do our lecture. Uh, so I'm Amanda. I'm Aiden. We, uh, we run Inspired Ink Studio, which is a 16 artist studio based out of Wisconsin. Um, most of our artists are students at Webster University. We use our um, we use our studio as a way for them to have a paid internship while they're finishing up their bachelor degrees. Most of the students are BAs in animation. Which a is what we graduated with. Yep, uh, we also graduated from Webster University with BAs in animation. Um, we also have uh, four alumni along with ourselves in the studio as well. And one of the professors and some professional, we have one professional comic book artist? We have one professional comic book artist who works for Zenoscope Comics who works in the studio and then we have um, one of our alumni also works for an animation company up in Canada working with Cartoon Network um, and then we have one artist who's a self-taught professional artist um, and she is a full-time fan artist just like us. And she's all the way in Croatia. Yes, and then we have our other professional full-time artist, who's a fan artist, who's a stay-at-home mom, and she is awesome as well. Yes. So she's very good at painting. Yes. Um, so do that's. Do you want to show anything? Well, uh, so the interesting thing about our studio is we print everything on metal. I know we're going to be printing stuff on metal for you guys. So this is a new piece that we just recently finished up. Uh, it is Opal from Steven Universe. I just pressed her just a little bit ago. Um, we use a technique called sublimation, which means the ink gets chemically bonded into the metal. Uh, it creates a really nice piece that's uh, fade proof, UV resistant, heat proof, and um, cleans with Windex. So that's our main product that we sell. We also work with a company called Tangerine Mountain. Um, they are one of the largest importers of Japanese vintage goods into the U.S. We work with them um, making tabi and um, bookmarks and we recently started printing uh, puzzles for them as well. Here's a bookmark. Yeah. Here's an example of our bookmark. This is done by Madison. This was her Mew. Um, and then as far as the puzzle goes, um, we have one, but it's <laughs> in it's a in box. it's in a couple pieces. Um, so this is what the puzzle looks like. Don't worry, um, did you switch cameras? It's I made us big. So. so this is what the puzzle looks like. Very pretty basic. It's actually. Um, the original material it was pulled from was a kimono making guide. Um, it is a wood block print. I know you guys were doing some print making, so think of that technique of having to place specific inks on a block, press it, um, get another block carved, place inks on that, and press that. Um, that was exciting because uh, that wood block was very old. That was like from the Meiji era in Japan or something yep. like that. And we got to look at a lot of really cool stuff from old, old-timey Japan. Um, some stuff from Hokusai and everything that was really awesome. Um, but yeah. That's like the print-making stuff. Um. Here's an example of the Tabby socks that we print for them. Um, they're all designs that were pulled from antique kimono um, that we then digitized and put on various fabrics. 
So they all come from various kimono, juban, and stuff like that. Um, Aiden mentioned Hokusai, uh, and we do actually have images of some of his works. Um, if, if you don't know what I'm referring to, he's the guy that made that super famous Japanese wave with uh, Mount Fuji in the background. That like everyone's seen it. It's just like a big wave, and it's like the stereotypical Japan picture. We got to hold some of his print books from when he was alive in like the 17, 1800s. Um, yes. And that was pretty fantastic. So that's what you're looking at right now. Yeah, so these are all very old images um, from wood carved print blocks that we're showing you kind of here. That was a beauty. Um, these were patterns that uh, would eventually be turned into kimono and then that's what we used to print the tabi. Um, and then the larger part of our business is um, obviously art and printmaking. Uh, we spend, um, yeah, uh, so we spend most of our time going to conventions. Um, as far as our students, uh, sorry, I wanted to make sure that you yeah could see the, what they were chatting. Um, as as far as our uh, internship that we do with our students, um, like I said, we mostly work with Webster University students, but we are open to working with other students. Um, we bring them in, we start them on line art. Um, well, we start them on, we start uh, teaching <coughs> on like anatomy, posing, composition of the major piece, and once they get that down, then they move on to line art and they focus on like uh, how tapered the lines are, how the, the weight of the lines and getting that really good. Then we move them on to backgrounds. Right? Yep. Then it's normally backgrounds and then um, once they hit that point we sometimes have them flat some of their work and then um, eventually they move on to doing full colored pieces. While they're within our program, uh, if we do a piece that we work on, for example, Trevor recently finished a Soldier 76 from Overwatch. Um, he uh, turned in that line art to us. I went ahead and colored it. Uh, he actually owns the coloration that I did on that work. So when he eventually leaves our studio, he leaves with a full portfolio filled with professional images versus just slowly building it up through the course of college and after college as well. Um, we center around going to anime and comic conventions. We're at a con pretty much every weekend, I would say. Um, we obviously were at Comic Palooza in Houston, which is why we're lecturing with you guys. That's how we kind of met up there. And then um, coming up this weekend, we're in Michigan. And then next week, we're actually going to be in uh, LA for Anime Expo. Um, and we are going to be releasing some special prints. Um, our artwork got picked up by a voice actor, and so we're going to be able to announce that voice actor and bring out that print within the next week or two. Um, we focus most, mostly on making fan art, which is art based off of uh, pre-existing IPs. Uh, fan art is a gray area. Um, because there's been no uh, specific court ruling on fan art. Uh, it very much exists within uh, the convention scene and the con community. It is a great way to make a living. Um, and it's a great way to get noticed by companies. A lot of companies, like Blizzard in particular, pick up fan artists um, because you know how to work in their style. Yeah, and it's a case of, uh, especially with conventions, fan art is the major thing that you see there because that's what people want to see fan art is basically the idea is you know I don't own Iron Man because I didn't make Iron Man but I can draw Iron Man doing something really cool looking and I own what I drew um, as long as it's an original pose and an original you know kind of idea for what's happening in the poster it doesn't have to be you know a hundred percent original because you know Iron Man's probably gonna be fighting something but um, you know, like, you, you try to create a new idea and a new pose and a new image from your imagination, and that's the 
part that's more of the gray area where it's like I can draw this character that I really like uh, and it's a, kind of a new idea off of a character that already exists so um, and people do original art as well it just doesn't sell as well because people don't know what it is uh, it's not as popular but uh, the piece that you're looking at right now is Star vs. the Forces of Evil fan art that was drawn by Joe Joe and he is a brand new member of uh, one of the students of our studio and he did the drawing for this and he lined it and he also flatted it and when we say flat we mean just the base colors no shading or anything and now Amanda is coloring it with shading highlighting special effects and all of that stuff uh, and this piece went through several critiques to get it to the point where it's at right now it originally had you know not a swoopy hair she wasn't holding her wand and I wanted that to be included the eyes were a little different and what we do with the students is critique until you get a really solid piece and sometimes it's really difficult because it's frustrating but it ends up with better art in the long run and that usually I mean like that always is a good thing you want to go through hardship to get to the point where you grow and you learn so we're kind of hard on our students but it gives them a good portfolio and good experience at the end of everything yeah definitely one of those pays off in the long run and art in general um, personally I am not uh, I'm not an artist I can't draw you're an artist <laughs> I learned uh, I eventually learned uh, how to color and that's how I decided to go kind of into the art world um, I got my degree in animation but I'm just not that good at it you know so even if you're not good at a specific thing when it comes to art um, that doesn't mean you don't have a career available to you it just means you might have to look a little bit harder and in a bit more of a different spot to figure out what your thing is. To clarify, she's good at coloring. She can't draw. Yeah. Like, as you said that, it kind of sounded like you were like, I color, I'm not that good at it. That's not what you were saying. But I do, um, I'm the main line artist for the studio. I do most of the stuff that's like the concept sketch and then bringing it to fruition uh, lining it and then I give it to Amanda and she does flats or sometimes the students do flats and then she does all the coloring and shading and uh, if we need it sometimes I draw a background sometimes she makes a background from Photoshop brushes uh, but yeah um, as far as the process with the metal um, can I show the paper the difference between yeah the sure um, so we're going to show you guys oops, the difference between what the paper kind of looks like when we print out the metal or when we print out what we press onto the metal versus uh, how the metal ends up looking. So okay, so this is it out of the printer. This is a fresh out of the printer opal um, pre-press. Um, this is a piece of paper after it's been pressed so you'll notice there's uh, pretty severe ink differences going on there her skin is much lighter um, because the ink actually uh, goes from a solid directly into a gaseous state by passing a liquid state and chemically bonds itself into the metal and so you end up with a metal print which looks like this but you can see it's backwards because Yep, because the paper gets pressed down. So you have to make sure when you're going to press the metal, every single piece is mirrored uh, when you go to print it. Oh, uh, my cat was writing emojis. Um, so uh, for the basic process of printing on the metal, um, we normally try to make sure our pieces have a lot more contrast in them than normal. Um, very dark darks, uh, bright bright colors in them. Um, the more the better. It just works out with it. Um, it's, you also have to keep in mind that anything that's white turns silver 
when printing on the silver metal. So can like, do you have the file? I do. Yes. Yeah. You have it on the flash drive. Yeah. Do the. Um. Oh goodness, where is she? There she is. So. I'm going to pull up the file right now and then you guys can see kind of the difference here. So we're going to shrink down to the bottom. So that's what the metal looks like and <laughs> yep. Okay, this so is what the right. uncolored version of her yeah, looks you like. Can, you can, uh turn off the colors and then show oh that's just the line art. Well that's what the line art looks like. That's the part that I yeah. do. So that's what here. You can see even in the uh, the blue that's there, it turns kind of more of a purple on the metal. Um, so there's a couple logistical things that you have to consider when you're printing onto the metal as far as do I want this image to look like this? Uh, what happens to the colors when they become lighter? Um, we do, on a lot of our clients' prints, end up increasing the saturation quite a bit um, and going from there on it. It's going to take a second to load this file. Alright, so here she is fully colored. And here's her metal. Bring the camera back. Yes. Oh, Sorry, I'm on a lag. Yeah, he's on a lag. You can see that it pretty much brings the true colors through. It's a little different because the metal's so shiny and because the metal is silver, so the whites are silver. You mm -hmm. can see that the most in her gem. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. And, and really subtle stuff doesn't come through as well on the metal, just like subtle differences between colors. That's why we say you have to up the contrast. Yep. Um, but yeah, and we have to hand cut and corner all the metal ourselves. Um, yeah, the metal comes to us in big 12 by 24 sheets. Uh, we then hand cut it down to a 12 by 18 we corner every corner and then we also um, clean and bag it if needed I hand press every single one each print um, just the printing process it takes about four minutes to print from our printer um, if possible we like to give the paper a day to dry if that's not possible I have to speed dry the paper in the print uh, in the heat press Moisture, uh, when it is pressed in a heat press, creates the steam, which will completely wreck a metal print. You can actually see steam marks in the middle of the print uh, showing up as white, kind of like blotches. It looks like steam. It's weird. Yeah. Um, uh, what are the best animation programs for an inexperienced animator? Tune boom. Preferably free. Uh, Toon Boom does have a trial version. It will keep a watermark on anything you make. Uh, but I would actually say look into that. It's a fairly standard industry program. Um, I'll type what that is. Yeah, Aiden's going to type it in the chat log just so you guys have it. Uh, you can animate as well in Photoshop if you have access to Photoshop, which is another good program to use. Um, our entire program was trained on Toon Boom. So every single person who graduated, at least in the years that we were there, which is, uh, I graduated in 2014, Aiden graduated in 2015, um, we were trained all four years on Toon Boom. Uh, for t that's for 2D animation, traditional yes. animation. You can also, there's like one other thing in Flash, but that's like for old people. <laughs> but for 3D, um, Maya, and can you animate in ZBrush? Uh, you can maybe animate in ZBrush. 
you can, uh, so there's a difference between 2D and 3D, obviously. If you're looking for a simplistic 3D program that is free, MMD, which also translates to Miku Miku Dance. Um, Anyone in the room knows what we're talking about. You're, you're a nerd. Yeah, <laughs> so Miku Miku Dance is a good uh, 3D program to work in. If you don't have access to the more expensive 3D programs, I actually did my entire thesis in that program. Uh, is it in English? It is in English. You can download it in English. Okay, it's, it's a also it's a Japanese program, so um, I advise getting the English, but I also advise learning Japanese. Um, Clip Studio EX added animation function. It's not free, but they have sales at least once a year. Um, only thing is, you have to put audio in a different program, and CS can't do audio as well. I also have animated using a mix of drawing things in Photoshop is sequentially. And then also uh, stitching it together with uh, Sony Studio Pro or any really good video editing program. Because I, I think I, I did everything in, in Sony Acid or s like. What? It was a weird program name. Audible? No, that's a book thing. Um, Autodesk? No, that's Maya. Um, it was, I think it was Sony Acid or Sony Video Editing. Audacity? No, that's just for audio for guitar nerds. Anyway, uh, any good video editing program can work with your animation software, probably, if it's good enough. If you export your animation and then edit it in a different, in a different um, program, it helps because a lot of animation programs don't have good audio editing and it's really important to sync up your animation with audio mm -hmm. uh, but Toon Boom does work really well for lip flaps because you can s go back and forth in frames yes. Toon Boom I would say is the best animation program it's what they use to color Princess and the Frog so uh, if that's anything to you yeah the other thing I would say and um, it's great to work digital and everyone should learn digital because that's just kind of where we are most of the time. That's but where the job market is. That's where the job market is. But if you're looking for a free animation program, go buy a ream of paper. Just go buy a ream of printer paper and do it traditional. Or little notepads. Yep, or little notepads and create flipbooks. And you um, take pictures of it. Yep, you just take pictures and you put the pictures together in a program uh, that can do video editing. There's normally, if you're on a PC... Oh, QuickTime. Yep. QuickTime Pro is really <coughs> good for putting uh, traditional animation together because yep. you can throw a bunch of uh, images in and it uh, sequences it for you mm -hmm. and it gives you timing. Photoshop also does it but it's a little more clunky because you have to do it with yeah. layers and everything. You can also do it in uh, Movie Maker as well which comes free on PCs. So Not anymore. It does? Okay, I'm sorry. I, I was mad at it when it didn't come with one version of Windows. Sorry. Yeah, no, it still comes on PC for free, so uh, you can always use that as well. Um, when you're doing traditional 2D animation, you normally want to work with what's called a light box. Um, this can be as simple as a clear tub with a flashlight in it. Um, if you want a more expensive light box, you can always hit up Amazon. They're like $25, $30. Basically what it does is it shines through the paper and allows you to animate your character and be able to see what you were doing just before then. Yeah, you can see through the pages so you can see what you previously put down so you can trace it and change it slightly in like, order to animate. Yeah, like lowering the opacity on a layer. So, um... Back in my day... We had Disney animation on floppy disks. That's what I started animating on. Um, but yeah, animation is one of those that once you learn it and you take the time to learn it, um, you don't easily forget what you've learned. Oh, and there's some uh, 
games and downloadable programs for Nintendo DS. Like, I know the old yes. DS had one, and I think they made a new one for uh, the bigger DS. Uh, yeah. But there's some programs that you can animate in, in that, and it'll flip back and forth through the frames for you, and... That's another alternative, on the go, a quick way to learn animation in your spare time. That, and it's fun. Uh, my my um, cousin started doing those, and that was pretty cool. Um, what other kind of questions do you guys have? Because I'm not sure where everybody's at with art, and we want to answer stuff that's more relevant to you guys. So. What do you want to learn? We know many things, I guess. Hopefully. <laughs> and it's just gonna keep coloring stuff. I am. By the way, we're working in Photoshop CS5. And I'm writing notes into the comments in case, you know, that helps. while they think of any questions, if they have any. Um, you want to explain how you color? Oh, wait. Oh, oh. I'm going to assume that's aspiring animators with no experience. The problem yeah. is we don't do a lot of animation for our studio. Yeah, our studio mainly focuses on doing fan art. Um, posters. Posters. Uh, but... There are still valuable things you can learn. We do talk definitely about weight, follow through, stuff like that. So, of course, we we accept people with no experience. Um, you just have to be ready to work. Uh, we don't go easy on people. We don't go easy on students. Um, we You have to be able to take critique. Yes. Uh, when <laughs> I'm going to single you out again, Trevor. When Trevor started with us, uh, he did a Ruby set that I think we went back and forth on for like a month. Yeah, Ruby is an RWBY, the... Uh, the animated show. Um, so we just kept making him go back again and again and again. Fix this piece, fix that piece, fix this piece. And the upside of working on posters and transitioning into animation afterwards is if you've learned how clothes work, You've learned how wrinkles need to look, and you've learned um, the basics of, you know, how a character is weighted. Uh, you can translate that easily into animation. Also, some if, if you've got aspiring animators, then I will share my advice for animators in general. Um, first of all, watch a lot of animation and pay attention to it. Watch mm -hmm. old stuff that's hand-drawn. Watch, you know... Richard Williams stuff, watch old Disney stuff, watch Ghibli films, Osamu Tezuka, uh, everything like that that's really good. Watch Pixar stuff, because they're really good, too. Yeah. Um, video games are also very valuable, like, in many different aspects. But there's a lot to learn about animation, because there's a lot of different types of animation. There's animating for video game characters, there's animating for 2D shows, there's animating for, like, graphics and logos and GIFs, GIFs, however you say it, whatever, um, there's animating for cartoons, there's animating for movies, like, Jurassic Park is basically puppets and 3D animation, and animation is, is everywhere, like, probably at least... 50 to 70 percent of commercials have some form of animation. Probably almost 100 percent, actually, if you consider like logos moving across the screen, have yeah. some form of animation in them. So there's a big market 
for it. Not as much for 2D hand-drawn animation anymore, but, like, you know, there's a lot to learn about animation. Um, and no matter what you want to go into with art, I think animation is really helpful to learn how to do and how to do well because the principles of animation apply to a lot of things. My major thing that I want to do that I like doing is comic comic art and sequential stuff that tells a story um, that's mostly, you know, in panels uh, showing a character doing something and then the next panel, you know, doing something else and stuff like that. And you have to use static images to get a message across of what's happening and learning animation helps a lot with knowing how to make good scenes for posters and for uh, efficient paneling for comic books because when you animate you have to do everything you you do the in-betweens you do the biggest action you do everything but uh, you learn through keyframing which is that that big motion like uh, if, if you're drawing someone walking and picking up an apple and eating it, the keyframes would be the most crucial moments of motion, like lifting your leg up, having a leg on the ground, passing the leg from the other leg to take another step, picking up the apple, and then it being at your mouth. Like, those would be the keyframes. Uh, and then everything else is in-betweens. What you learn from keyframes is what the biggest action is that you need to convey in order to understand the what is happening in a scene and basically comic book art is keyframes in the panels because you don't have time to basically draw every moment of motion when you only have so much space on a page so you learn what the 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 most you know important thing is to show that's another thing with poster art is you want to show the most dynamic moment of motion that your character is doing. Like Star in this poster, um, Joe did a really good job because Star is not standing still, which is boring. Star is not uh, about to fall, um, which could be interesting, but not the most amazing moment in, in action. She's f actively falling or flying or whatever, and that's where people want to see a character is when it's the most interesting and dynamic. We use the word dynamic a lot to describe how to do poses and composition, and that's partially how I learned how to do that, and also um, studying film and how, like, literal camera filming is done. Alfred Hitchcock did a lot of really good stuff with how he f frames a scene, uh, and you learn a lot of how to make something look good by how people have filmed really good films in the past. So those are things I learned because I was in animation that helped me in other areas. Something else that really helped with drawing in general was I used to do a lot of cosplay and I used to do it competitively and um, that cosplay is costume play, literally the word is made up of those two words. And, uh, I, so basically I, I sewed a lot of costumes. And by learning how to sew and how to make, uh, clothing, and how the pieces of clothing fit together to create clothing, um, I learned where seams are and how to draw clothing better. Uh, so learning how to make any physical object, any kind of craft, helps you learn how to draw it, in my opinion. Also, something stupid but also actually helpful that I did uh, to get better at drawing without knowing it was I played a lot of The Sims as a kid uh, and pretty much any game that has a character creator that's that intricate where you can like, it, specifically The Sims 2 and onward, uh, anything that has a character creator where you can make it so specifically that you move the brow ridge or, you know, the the different pieces of the nose and the anatomy of the face. I played, like, The Sims a whole bunch over one summer just making a bajillion characters, and I moved those little dials so much, and I learned where each piece of the face is so much that it, when I 
drew for a while after that summer, I like was better at facial structure. So anything that like has to do with anatomy helps you a lot. And you wouldn't think that video games would help, but they do sometimes. Um, the other thing is, if you're looking to go into animation as a career, um, you do to some extent need to be realistic. Animation is a very, very hard field to get into. Um, a lot of people get animation degrees and then go on to do something else with those degrees. Um, graphic design, comic book making, fan artistry, whatever it may be. Um, out of, oh gosh, I think we started with like 30 kids in my year program at college. Uh, only four of us graduated and only one of us has a job in animation at this point. Um, now, not every program is going to be as tough as Webster's was, um, but it is something to consider. Um, do I want to do animation because this is what I want to do with my life? Or do I want to do animation because this is a good, productive way for me to learn how to do art and view things in a new way that is going to further X, Y, or Z art career. I'm writing down uh, the animators that I mentioned. The other thing is uh, you should know what, why you want to go into animation. And if your answer is ever because it's cool, you're going to hate it. I mean, um, well, okay. <laughs> it's really hard, I guess, is the thing that you need to understand. Is that, like, you have to have passion for it. And patience. Because it's tedious and annoying. And all of the uh, programs for animation are very frustrating as any art programs usually are. Photoshop has gotten pretty streamlined at this point, but like Maya hates everyone, and ZBrush hates everyone, and Toon Boom crashes every five minutes. And that's not to deter you, but it is kind of to warn you of like, if you want to go into animation, the stereotype is, oh yay, cartoons, it'll be fun, it's child's play, it's kids, it's yay, and cartoons and pretty and colors and it'll be easy and it's it's not easy it's a lot of work and it's a lot of patience and it's a surprising amount of math yeah there is <laughs> a lot of math in animation you, you have to um, time out how many drawings you need per frame of the like there's 24 frames per second and uh you have to figure out how long you want to show something on a screen for it to look right and it there, it was a surprising, like, not, like, hard math, but just, like, a lot of math and addition and charting things out and, like, making little graphs to figure out how long you're gonna show an action for and stuff like that. I mean, the other thing is, when I did my thesis, like I said, I did it in MMD, which was a 3D program, which meant um, I could pretty much just place my keyframes and then the program used... Uh, mathematic algorithms to help the character move more, uh, to help it go from point A to point B. Sometimes that worked, sometimes it didn't, and I had to go in and edit those, uh, but my final project, which was a three minute animation, had over 70,000 frames. My, I'm sorry, Good, finish no, what you were saying. Um, if you do not think you can sit at a computer for hours at a time staring at the same character and literally making hundreds of drawings for a few seconds worth of movement, animation is probably not what you're looking to go into. My final project was a three minute, 30 second, uh, traditionally, well, 2D animated mo uh, video, and it had like 3,400 drawings. 
Yeah. It was a lot of drawings. Uh, as far as our studio, the programs that we use, we use Photoshop and we use Lazy Nezumi. Um, Photoshop, depending on where you are as far as school, uh, you can get a pretty cheap uh, subscription to it, or sometimes it comes free, depending on the school that you go to. We use um, Photoshop CS5 because I don't like paying for subscriptions to programs. Correct. Because I bought um, this in college. So we do have all of our students using Photoshop, and then we have them use Lazy Nezumi. What Lazy Nezumi does, it also works for Toon Boom and a couple of the other um, things that we've said in the past. Um, do you want to pop it up? Yeah. Lazy Nezumi, when it is turned on, let me create a new layer here. Um, let's say I'm going to go draw a line. Yeah, just move this over here. Um, so right. I'm going to draw a line really quick without Lazy Nezumi. And then with Lazy Nezumi, I have a lot more control. Do you want to draw a slow line to show how shaky it is? Yeah, uh, let me draw a slow one really quick. Do a squig lower. So without Lazy Nezumi drawing that slow, you end up with a very shaky line. Whereas with it, you end up with a very smooth line. Can you zoom in on the squiggles a little bit? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Lazy Nezumi is a line stabilizer program that can go on top of not just Photoshop, but anything, I think. It's uh, definitely can go in Clip Studio Pro, I think. It can also go in Toon Boom. Yeah. So if you're looking to do an, uh, 2D animation in Toon Boom, this is a very good program to have. Um, for people who join our studio, um, we haven't in the past, but we are open to paying for subscriptions for Photoshop, and we do uh, provide Lazy Nezumi to every person in our studio. Um, because we are a very pro artist studio, obviously we're artists, um, we care about artists, we do our best to make sure things are accessible. Um, an example is one of our artists who just joined the studio recently, she's a traditional artist, um, she doesn't have a scanner, like a good one, so we, um, we bought her a very nice Epson scanner. Um, yeah, uh, we've bought uh, tablet pens for people. We've helped obtain tablets for people. You know, we're we're willing to put in investment money into anyone who joins the studio if you're willing to put in the work. Uh, yeah. You said and it's here? Uh, it's either... Actually, go to Studio Works. Oh, it's on the right this. side. Um, we're going to show you her traditional... It should be Sailor Moon, Sam, or... Yeah. Uh, oh, it's under finished, I guess. I'm sorry. I make everything inaccessible. Sailor Moon, Sam. Okay, so this is Sailor Moon. This was done by our artist, Sam. Um, so Aiden went in and did the line art on it. So that's how it ended up looking because we ended up using a cell phone photo for it um, when we brought it in. She's actually going to be traditionally painting everything in watercolor and then scanning it in. So we will be keeping uh, two copies of this in our studio, one the traditional and one the digital, um, which I might have the digital here. Uh, so you can see what I ended up doing to this piece afterwards. Um, so again, it's not necessarily that you need experience to join our studio or you need a specific thing to join. Um, we just ask that you make sure you're, you're spending time actually working with the studio. You communicate. Um, you communicate with us. Uh, that's a big thing. We do have... Um, a lot of people in our studio who are incapable of uh, producing high volumes worth of work. 
due to personal reasons. Um, and we work with them on that, you know, be it they have finals or they have depression or they had an anxiety attack and just couldn't get it done. You know, we're, we're pretty understanding of all that. And um, our goal is to create a better art community that fosters creativity and helps people succeed within this field. Yeah, and uh, to touch on the mental mental health kind of thing is uh, what I've seen a lot in Artist Alley, the dealer's room, in anime conventions and comic book conventions, a lot of artists do what kind of what we do as in selling fan art, selling posters that you draw. They do this lifestyle because they can't work normal job sometimes because it's there, there's definitely some sort of correlation or statistic where a lot of artists have depression and anxiety I do um, and I freak out if I have to work a normal job I just have panic attacks every single day before I go to work I freak out and it's, it's bad um, and this allows me to do something that I can manage that I'm good at. I mean, I wanted to be an artist anyway, but like, I, I've noticed that a lot of people who do this, who choose to do this kind of lifestyle, do it partially because they can't be normal, I guess, uh, is kind of how it is. Um, and, and it's not to say that, you know, people with mental illness aren't normal. There is no normal, but, you know, like, you don't have to do the stereotypical nine, nine to five. five I have a house and a wife and two and a half kids and everything you know like there's everyone's lifestyle should suit whatever you are as a person you know one thing I will say um, about uh, we've been doing conventions uh, for three years now full-time which means our full-time job has been spending hours and hours and hours in a car driving to a show setting up selling whatever product it was that we had at that time and um i think our longest drive was like 40 hours or something i don't know like 38. uh 38 but we are hitting a 36 hour drive next weekend um and for us it's worthwhile um it gives the people in our studio really great exposure um, it gives us a chance to talk and work with some amazing artists. Uh, we meet artists who work with Marvel, who work with DC. We talk to a lot of anime voice actors. We talk to a lot of celebrities. I, um, we get to meet uh, animators. Yep. That's what all the old Disney animators are doing right now. They go to conventions and like hang out together. If any, oh God, I don't know. Everybody's really young. You probably don't even know what Ren and Stimpy is. But Bob Camp is always hanging out at conventions, just chilling with people. Uh, the creator of, um, like one of the persons, one of the people who works on The Simpsons is always at Wizard World, hanging out. Uh, but like uh, people that worked on Aladdin, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, all the old old Disney. But, like, all the old Disney movies, uh, a lot of them just do the con circuit now because they got laid off by Disney, of course, because 2D animation is tough. Uh, and expensive. And expensive. But, um, but I, uh, we, meet, we meet a lot of really cool people, and that's another yeah. thing that's cool about this. You, you definitely, if you decide to go the route of... Uh, Independent, independently selling a comic or working for a larger comic company or being a fan artist, you do enter into a very tight-knit community. Um, you will have people who watch out for you and you essentially end up with a family that you see every weekend um, at different places around the U.S. Um, and you do get to see some cool stuff as well. Like there's there's a ton of added benefits um, we also, in our specific program, we do our best to try and make sure that our students go to at least one or two conventions so they can see their work up there, uh, they can see, um, response to the work. We should show what our booth looks like. 
I don't have a photo of that. Um, and um, they can get a sense of how people perceive their stuff. Uh, if you are looking to go into the con circuit and you're looking to be a comic artist or something like that, um, taking critique is something you're going to have to do and something you need to learn to do properly. In, um, in general, in if general, you want to be an artist at all, period, you have to be able to take critique. And uh, you have to have a thick skin, uh, especially um, if you are a woman who is looking to work in this type of field. Um, you just, you have to have a thick skin. Um, what kind of animation is easiest to learn? Uh, why are you asking that? That's, that's the question. No, I mean, like, why are you asking it that way? Um. It's nothing is easy. Um. It's all the same principles. So, truthfully, um, you should be learning 2D animation because it is going to give you the best foundation. It's not easy. Animation isn't easy to learn. Uh, it is something you have to take time, you have to dedicate yourself to, but it is rewarding. And it is, in some ways, going to come easier for some people than it will for others. Um, but YouTube is an ever-expanding, you know, massive videos to help teach you various principles. Um, and once you learn the basics of animation, you're going to be solid. Um, so it's not necessarily that 3D is easier than 2D to learn. One just takes longer to do, depending on how much you're doing with uh, 3D. I'm pasting a link, hopefully it'll work, to a picture of our booth. Why is it not working? Copy image address. You can see what our booth looks like. That might work. I will bring it up. The Facebook image. So that's what our booth looks like. Uh, just to give you guys an idea. Um, these four Ruby right here. This is student work. Uh, this was done by Madison, who those is. Bookmarks. Um, yep, those are all bookmarks. But that was done by Madison, who's now working in Canada. Um, let's see. Kirby here was done by Rain Lynn. She's a stay-at-home mom. She also did the League of Legends down here. Um, let's see, what else? This Dark Sora was done by us. Um, There's Shahid's. Uh, oh, yeah, the Dark Souls down here was done by Shahid. Uh, he's another one of our students. Um, Ruby, like I said, was done by Trevor. Um, let's see. The Eva was done by Quinn, who's another student of ours. Um, You've got Melody's Dark uh, Souls no here. Game, no life. Yeah, Melody isn't a student. Uh, she's a tattoo artist in Kansas City. Um, she did our No Game, No Life. Lindsay did our Genos in Saitama. She is an alumni working with us. Um, and Tiana's Tali is on there. Yeah. Uh, Tiana, who's our Croatian artist, she did this Tali right here. Um, she also did Suicune and Entei. Um, I'm not seeing any other students, I don't think. Or Chris. Oh, there's Quay, but you can hardly see the Spirited Away. Yeah, so Quay did the Spirited Away here. He's another alumni of Webster. Um, so, just, just a lot of different stuff. Oh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Trevor's like, no, don't deter all of them. Yeah, um... It's... Yeah, it... Uh, well, okay. The, something easy to get into, I guess, uh, I would say, is to start... Do people still... Trevor, do people still draw with Flash? Uh, I would honestly say start with flipbooks. Um... Or Photoshop. Photoshop's really... Okay, here's how I use Photoshop to animate. I draw something and then I make the opacity on that layer like 50% oh, and then I draw another thing and that's slightly moved and continue that forever. <laughs> and then I use Photoshop's animation feature to string it all together or I throw all those different pictures into Sony Vegas. That's what it's called, Sony Vegas. That's easy for me because if you do limited animation, like not with all of the in-betweens and everything, that's 
fun. Um, there's also a lot of, I think it's called Daz, Daz, D-A-S, uh, is a free, I think, animation program that you can do 3D stuff in. I will type those. Um, but yeah, it, you just have to get the principles down, um, and you, you just have to keep going at it. Uh, personally, I think flip books are the better way to start, but each animator is going to have their own thing that they say. Uh, flip books are pretty easy. Toon Boom is, to me, the easiest. If, if, yeah, if you can get a hold of Toon Boom, that's really nice to work on. I might yes. have it on my computer. Uh... Do you want me to search? Yeah. Toon Boom. We'll see if we can open up Toon Boom for you guys. It's been a long time since I saw that loading screen. Toon Boom 7. God, remember when we switched to Toon Boom 7 and everyone's stuff broke? Yeah. That was terrible. Can I, uh, sit there? Yes. I'm just creating a whatever. Let it have a problem. Let it do its thing. This is what Toon Boom looks like. We're gonna hook Lazy Nezumi to it. Toon Boom has a stabilizer, so you might not need it. You can... But, yeah, it's up to you. That is a beautiful circle right there. You need Lazy Nezumi, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, uh, you end up with your drawing, your camera, various frames down here. Um, you can onion your frames so you see what's before and after um, which is this one where I'll show you uh, previous three drawings and the next two drawings or whatever so yeah, you can see you'll it see fading. it fading it's called onion skin because onions are thin yeah you can see through them so I'm gonna just do A really terrible, non-consistent animation here. You straight ahead artist. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there's two different uh, types of animation. One is called straight ahead and the other is called keyframing. Uh, what I'm doing right now where I'm just kind of like drawing this ball slowly going across. Inconsistently <laughs> and terribly. <laughs> inconsistently and terribly going across the screen. Um, <laughs> it's not even bouncing. It's just going. <laughs> what are you doing? It's flying, okay? Um, would be Goodbye. called straight ahead. Um, and then I can go back to the beginning here. Uh, you can see the green has appeared. That's showing me my next two drawings. And you can see this just very... It kind of bounces. Kind of you like... Press space, press space. It's so sad. Um, you can press the space and it'll oh no. play. We... Um, and you can, can tell it's a loop. Go forever. Look at it go. It's beautiful. Yeah, look at that go. It's beautiful. So I this can show keyframing. So this would be on ones. Um, you can always go in and uh, let's say I want something to. Oh, there are shortcuts for this that I have forgotten. I know. Um, oh, why is it not working? Uh. Oh, there's someone here wanting to start using Toon Bloom, but doesn't know how to get started learning the software. Any advice or resources for learning? Oh, we're literally doing that right now. Yeah, okay. um... Eraser. Uh... Something I loved about Toon Bloom. If... Don't freak out if it looks like you're erasing your camera. Uh, it comes back, I promise. So, um... I can also go through, let's say I want to um, add a keyframe. Uh -huh. The eye key. Just, just. Oh, why doesn't it not work? Why is it broken? Our tune boom is a little broken because we haven't used it in 
like two or three years. The program gets rusty. <laughs> oh, here we go. Uh, so I'm going to set exposure to two. Yay. Uh, and I'm going to do that, which is apparently control two for everything. And this is called animating on twos. Um, which means instead of needing 24 drawings per second, you would need 12. Which is cheaper. Which is cheaper. Uh, and then you can you can watch my terrible thing kind of move across the screen with no principles of animation used on it. Um, Not a single one. But yeah, YouTube is for sure uh, your friend. Um, I agree with jumping in and pressing buttons. Yes, um, that is literally how I learned Photoshop. That's that's one of the best ways to learn things. And even even now, like I've been working in Photoshop for more years than I want to admit and um, even still Aiden and I will be like oh did you know you could do this thing in Photoshop like just yesterday I was editing a photo and I was like look at this cool thing I learned to do mm -hmm. um, so just get in there and press buttons I mean you're not gonna break the program to an ear to a point where restarting it won't fix it and um, if you do, you can just reinstall it. Yeah, so that would that would definitely be my suggestion. Um, if you are super lost or you do want basics, check out YouTube. Um, Toon Boom is fairly straightforward with how it works. Um, and it's it's easy. It's fast to pick up. I guess it is. Nothing. No animation is necessarily easy as in like, I don't know, we don't want to make it sound too easy, but Toon Boom is pretty easy to yeah. figure out, because it's all right there. It's not like super intricate like how ZBrush is. Yep. Um, and then of course there's principles of animation, uh, which you can learn through various videos. They'll show you various examples of them. Um, one thing that you can find abundantly on YouTube is um, flower sack animations. Um, flower sack teaches you um, how weight moves, um, gives you kind of a, a loose character. Uh, think of Oogie Boogie from Nightmare Before Christmas and how he moves. Um, animating flower sacks is a good good starting point. Yeah. So Aiden's going to jump on and do some drawings really quick in Toon Room. Yay. Okay. Um. <clears throat> do, do, do. How do I make a new layer? That's how cool. Um, so, I'm using the brush tool in, in uh, Toon Boom. That's right here. That's the basic thing. You can just jump into this program, click this button, and start doing things. And down here, you've got your keyframes. And I, I pressed the wrong button. But you know, you can just start making new keyframes and start doing drawings. So if you're jumping in, that's, you know, the basic, hello, here I am, here is Toon Boom. I'm going to turn off the stabilizer so I can draw faster. But um, what we learned in our animation program was that uh, flower sacks are extremely useful to learn how to animate because most the cartoon characters can be broken down into the basic shape of a flower sack and when I say a flower sack I mean literally a sack of flour like this Oof. so you can see when you're drawing a character if you if you can animate a flower sack you can probably animate almost anything is kind of the basics of what we learned because it doesn't have a face, but you can still portray emotion. It doesn't have arms or legs, but it has these little things. Um, and it doesn't have a body or a head, but it kind of does, because it kind of does. So, let me show you an example. Uh, and also, it's, you know, it's got weight to it, so it's really easy to show how weight is kind of moving. How do I, how do I, what's the, what's the freaking, oh, it's gone now. 
I forget the uh, thing that just adds another new keyframe. It has been many years since I have used this program. Sorry, guys. I didn't want to press that. Why is it different now? Sorry. Okay. Let's, uh... Oh. Go away. What did I do? Okay, I entered like a quick mask or something weird. Alright. So, we've got our flower sack. And he's got weight in the bottom, because that's where our, most of the flower is. And then... Oh, if you just start drawing, it makes a keyframe. Okay. He's gonna slump forward. And I'm gonna show an example of keyframing, I guess. Um, and then he's gonna floop down. I did this in college. Why do I always want to draw the flower sack just falling over? Apparently he just needs to be defeated. Um, and another animation technique is squash and stretch which is like when a ball does this and it hits the ground and it goes squoosh and then it goes back up and it stretches that's squash and stretch pretty self-explanatory um, so if we have our flower sack doing that just that simple action that could be the keyframes and then uh, we move this stuff a little bit. No, I don't want to move everything. Um, we do the in betweens, which is basically, you know, if you do it the keyframing uh, technique, you literally just draw what's in between the keyframes. And I like keyframing because it helps to make things more planned out. I guess. It also helps keep sizing consistent. Yes, it does. It does help keep sizing consistent. Because when you know what your drawing is going to look like at the end of it, you know how to keep it looking consistent so that it, it's not just like all over the place. But, yeah, I have not animated for quite some time. This is crazy. But, you know, you get the basic idea of, like, drawing the in-betweens, um, to make it move. Um, and the more in-betweens you add, the more, uh, smooth your animation gets. That's why Ghibli films look so good, is because they've got, like, a bajillion uh, in-betweens. Disney operates on 36 frames per second as well. Yeah, Disney has more frames than a normal... Uh, animation, that's why it looks so good. Well, I mean, like, they're really good at drawing, but also, it looks really good because, uh, they have more frames, which just adds quality. I'm gonna do a bouncing ball, because that's, like, the most basic thing we can do. Um, Amanda? Yeah? Anyway, uh, yeah. Another uh, really important principle of animation is um, uh, anticipation, which is where, uh, like, if somebody's going to throw a ball, you draw them uh, winding up first and then throwing it, and that adds, like, oomph to your animation. I added way too many frames. This is gonna be the smoothest. Oh, it's gonna just stop at the top. Okay. When you put a lot of frames next to each other, like what I'm doing here, like I've got a bunch of drawings right next to each other, it's gonna slow it down. So it's gonna bounce and then just slow down. Boom, boom. That doesn't even make any sense because there's just nothing in between. Let's fill that in. All right. Let's see what that looks like. Boom. Boom, boom. It just slows down at the end. <laughs> but, uh, that's, like, a very cruddy example of, like, squash and stretch. If I were to do this better, I would add even more stretch so that this is just squooshed down right there. So, boink. So that makes it feel more elastic-y. 
And if I actually take away, let's take away this frame to make it have even more elastic to it. Boing, boing, boing. Yeah, see, like, uh, just uh, manipulating singular frames changes how you feel the animation. It's going too fast for you to specifically say that you're seeing each individual frame because it's, it's a fraction of a second, but just with how things are arranged here, with how many frames we give a certain motion or whatever, that that can uh, affect how it feels. So I added a bunch of frames at the end here, so and they're all really close together. This ball is really close together in each frame, so that's going to make it feel like it's slowing down. So let's see what that looks like. Oof. Yeah, so it's kind of elastic because it's got that stretch, squash and stretch. And then uh, this is called this right here. This is easing in where you put a lot of, like, this is, this is, uh, this is going fast. One is here, then two is over here, then three is all the way over here, and then four is here, and then five is really close. Six, seven, eight, nine, and I'm just counting. There's no numbers anywhere, but I'm just counting the drawings. Uh, and they're all really close together, and that's easing into an action. And then if this were to go faster afterwards, it would be easing out. Um, those are principles of animation. And I could go into more principles of animation if you guys want me to. Um, if you have questions, feel free to just tell me, because I'm, at this point, I'm just gonna explain how animation works. Um, but yeah, this would be good if there was, like, if, okay, uh, I can do another thing on a separate layer. Okay, we can see where our ball goes. It kind of goes over this point right here. So I'm going to actually go on a layer below it and draw a wall. Ho oh, ho. And if I go to this paint bucket, the fill tool, let's make it a bright, disgustingly turquoisey wall. Okay, how do I... I forget how to do this. Give me a second. Uh, extend, add exposure? Oh, wait, 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 wait. If I add exposure R? No, 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 no. There's a way to, I want to extend this to everything. Insert cell? No, that's not exactly what I wanted. No. Can I just lengthen it? Well, hmm. there was an easy way to do this, and I forget how. Which is sad. Because I used to know this program super well. Um, well, either way. I? Does I do that? Does K do that? No. Can I just insert another cell? I guess I can. No, that's a different cell. Oh well. Um, well, there's a wall there. Pretend there's a wall there. I put a wall there. It's a magic wall. Anyway, basically, you can put stuff on different layers, including like stuff that stays still, stuff that moves independently, stuff like that. Um, uh, tell me more. Tell me questions. What, what do you guys want to learn? Um, that's the bouncing ball. That's good for squash and stretch. Um, anticipation. Let's do anticipation. Anticipation is important. Uh, I guess the best way to show it is just a dude throwing a ball. He's, he's got a baseball. He's gonna bring it up like a sassy man, <laughs> apparently. And he's gonna have a lot of jitter. Uh, the stuff you see where stuff like kind of moves like that is called jitter, animation jitter, and that's with uh, traditional animation. Thank you for your time. A few people are still listening. Mostly have gone back to working on projects. If you have other things to do right now, feel free to sign off. Okay. Um, well, 
sorry if it got boring at the end. I was just uh, going into animation. That's the tedious stuff. That's the stuff you need to learn, honestly. Um, but let me just show. Oh yeah, good. That would be good. Um. So anticipation is doing the opposite of an action before you do a big action, like winding up and throwing it. Scooby-Doo does that where he winds up his run, and then you snap forward really fast. So let's look at what that looks like. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, inspiredinkmail at gmail.com if you want to get in contact with us. Also, we check Facebook often. Person with a motorcycle outside. Um, uh, and we, would, uh, we love giving advice. We love doing critique. If you have any questions, feel free to ask us. Um, and we'd love to help you with anything that you need help with. And thank you for the opportunity to talk to you guys. Thanks for listening. Um, and keep doing art. <laughs>